Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'm uh, Pastor Tim Westermeyer, one of the pastors here at St. Philip the Deacon. And uh, on behalf of St. Philip the Deacon and all of our sponsors, it is my uh, privilege and pleasure to welcome you here tonight to this uh, fourth installment of our five Faith and Life events this season. I always like to ask at the outset, uh, how many of you have never been to a Faith and Life event before? Quite a few of you. Excellent. Well, special welcome to all of you, and of course, a welcome to those of you who have maybe been following us for a while. Um, I have said this before because it's true. Uh, n not infrequently, faith and life events um, coincide with beautiful days outside. Um, and so for that, I simply say, you're welcome. Um, is, is anyone following the NCAA tournament, by the way, also? This is totally unrelated to our... So I, some of you who know me, I have a junior son who is a, a student at Gonzaga, and I did not know when I scheduled this that they would be playing in the first round of the tournament, I think right now. So, but I would rather be here. I really would. Um, anyway, it's good to have you all here. If you have not been to the Faith and Life series in the past, and this is the 16th uh, season of these events, uh, from the beginning, we have cast a very broad net in terms of uh, the types of speakers that we have come. Um, all of them are Christian. That's sort of the point of the series, is to hear people who are Christian talk about their faith and how it informs whatever it is that they do. So we've had doctors, we've had lawyers, we've had politicians, we've had, um, uh, what else, teachers. We've, we have had some theologians. Um, some pastors and priests, but not many of those. Most of the folks who speak are uh, lay people who do interesting and exciting things in the world, and that is certainly the case with our speaker tonight. Um, she is a blogger and a writer and a teacher and an accidental uh, business person. You can read about her bio either here or online, but one of the things, if you've been here before, I always like to ask our speakers, uh, when I typically when I pick them up from the airport, which was the case today, is, you know, is there anything sort of that wouldn't be in a typical bio that I can say as I introduce you tonight? Um, so she had a few items that she shared with me, uh, and one of them actually she didn't, she told me, she didn't indicate this was something I could use, but I think it's appropriate. Uh, one of the things is that she does Oh, no, don't worry. <laughs> um, it's good. No, she, I think I got this right. You only do three or four talks like this annually anymore, is that right? Mm -hmm. So she picks and chooses carefully based on what interests her, which suggests to me that she thought this seemed like a fascinating uh, opportunity to present and a wonderful group of people to present to. So thank you for saying yes. The other data points are she is a big traveler, as you will no doubt understand based on the title of this talk. She's been to 45 countries. Yeah. As of today, she's been to 41 states. Guess which her 41st was? Yes. Yay. So welcome to Minnesota. Yeah. And uh, last but not least, and I think she'll say more about this, she met her husband by way of a, a, of a bet. So I don't know what that means, but I am delighted to welcome <coughs> Tish Oxenreiter. Thank you. It is so good to be here. And as he said, yes, this is number 41 for me. I've actually always wanted to come to Minnesota. I wasn't quite sure based on the time of year that I wanted to come here. And when my husband Kyle and I first talked about it, we we're like, ooh, that's our kids' spring break. We could come as a family, we can turn this into a vacation. And then uh, a few months ago, we were like, wait a minute, spring break time there doesn't mean shorts and wildflowers like it does in Texas. And so as I was flying in, I was looking out the window and noticed like, what are, why is there these random blobs of concrete out in Minneapolis? And I was like, oh, that's snow, right. <laughs> They still have snow. <laughs> so it's really good to be here. My family and I will have to come here again another time, maybe in August, when it's miserable where I am in Austin. And I hear it's not too shabby up here. Well, I am a wife of 16 years now and a mom of three kids, ages 8 to 14. And the five of us had traveled together to 30 countries by the time our oldest was 10. 
My husband Kyle and I met overseas in war-torn Kosovo in the year 2000, where you were both working for separate NGOs. And how I met him actually was I lost a bet. We were, it was August, it was sweltering hot, and I was with my team of people. We were living in a village two kilometers from the Serbian border. This was a very dilapidated village, no electricity, dirt roads. It was 500 people, middle of nowhere. And we heard that an American was going to come in and move and start working via another NGO. And none of us wanted to get out and move <laughs> and say hi to him. We were all hot. And so we literally drew straws. And I drew the short straw. And so I had to go out and meet him and introduce him to myself and, you know, welcome him to the village. And so to this day, we can point an X on the road where we met literally on the one dirt road of our little village. So I was teaching English and he was rebuilding houses destroyed in the conflict with Serbia. And because we both brought to the relationship a separate love for cross-cultural living and travel, this simply became a thing we did together. After Kosovo, we moved to the US, we got engaged, we traveled around the world to check out potential places for us to live and work, and eventually we settled on Turkey. So we moved there when our oldest was two years old. I say all of this to just paint the picture, lay the foundation that travel is in our family's DNA. Kyle and I knew that when we made our family that we wanted to make travel part of our family's culture from the get-go. And so I'm here tonight, I want to make the case that travel can be more than escapism, it can be more than fun, and it can be more than just a form of privileged entertainment. I honestly believe that travel is good for your soul, it's good for your spiritual growth, and it's good for your betterment as a human. And I really believe that everyone should make an effort to do so cross-culturally at least once, once in their life if they're able. So just to back up a little bit, the year is 2010, and we had suddenly moved back to the US from Turkey. I say sudden because we weren't really planning on moving back. We were just planning to visit for a little bit. We were gonna get some medical checkups and visit family. I was actually pregnant with number three. Well, we got some health-related news about our middle guy, my son, that led us to the conclusion that we needed to move back to the States for the foreseeable future. So in 2010, my youngest, Finn, he's a newborn, and we're adjusting to a sudden relocation back to the States where we had to piecemeal a brand new house from thrift store furniture and suddenly live there. You know, we left an apartment in Turkey full of furniture, full of everything set up. Our friends that went there later to help us sell our things said it felt like going to Pompeii because things were still like up on the wall. You know, there's pictures of our kids' drawings on the fridge, and we suddenly had to leave. And so not only were we having to piecemeal a new life together, we were having to suddenly adjust to this idea of no longer living cross-culturally. That's all we had known in our family until then. Our oldest was five, and so having lived there for, in Turkey for three years by then, this meant that this is really all she knew was living cross-culturally. And same with our middle guy. He was born in Turkey. So suddenly we're making this replacement life post-Turkey, and we were grieving a loss at this point. You know, I had a newborn in my hands, and we had planned to raise our kids cross-culturally since we've ever met long-term. And Turkey had also been a formative experience for us as well. Kind of as a side note, it wasn't too long after we moved to Turkey that I was actually diagnosed with depression. It wasn't that Turkey caused a depression. It actually revealed it, the cross-cultural move, that I had probably had depression for several years. And so our international move helped that. We actually went to Thailand for some therapy and for some adjustments uh, for our mental and emotional state so that we could relocate back to Turkey healthy, healthy and well. And uh, through all this, part of my therapeutic process of healing was to begin writing. And it had always been an interest of mine, and I won't get into the details tonight, but in all this, I accidentally started a new career for myself as a writer. I was not looking for that, but it turned out to be a whole new thing. And all of this happened in our apartment in Turkey. I wrote my first book in my little desk in Turkey. And so this place really was an important part of our family history. And for us to suddenly move away from that was a big deal. 
And so here we were in this rental in Austin, not sure of what was next. We had just accepted a new position working with a new US-based nonprofit, and it meant moving up to Oregon. Kyle grew up in Oregon, actually, so we had family there. And in this whole process, we realized we're going to be stateside for a while. So I confessed to Kyle with Finn in my arms one day, sitting in our living room. I was sitting on the couch while our older kids were playing on the floor in front of us. I still want to live cross-culturally. I still want to show our kids the world. And yet, I don't think we have to live overseas to give them that. What do you think about maybe one day us showing our kids the world literally by going out there with them and traveling with them? Well, Kyle was immediately on board because after all, this was in our family's DNA. Another kind of side thing about this whole experience, because we were working with a nonprofit and had been for several years by then, and having essentially started our life together in Kosovo, we initially kind of started off with this idea of travel that as Christians, there needed to be some kind of added noble cause to travel. You know, when we were living in Turkey and had the opportunity, we took a week-long vacation to Paris. And it was in that experience and in lots of talking and self-awareness and honestly maturity, we came to the realization that we had sort of been glorifying this idea of a cross-cultural life as a way that made us feel like we were doing God's work just by being out of our home country because we were going with this motive of service. You know, that's not bad, completely legitimate. I don't mind this kind of thing for a second. We still support lots of work around the world involved like this. But going to Paris and truly relaxing and just enjoying ourselves gave us this realization that, wait a minute, we can also travel just to enjoy a place, just to be fully there. And that that can be a holy thing as well, that that can be an idea blessed by God as well. So we came to this dream of one day taking our kids around the world, and while, yes, of course we still want to serve God, and we still want to show our kids what it means to live a life of service, but we also wanted to travel for the sake of travel, for the sake of enjoying the world God created. So we moved up to Oregon. We even bought a house, and we settled down for a little bit. Our oldest started going to school there. We started our work with this new nonprofit, and I continued to build my business, and it grew and grew and became this thriving thing. And yet all of this, over the years, one day, we had thought, one day, we're going to go out there and show our kids the world. And so one evening, several years into living in Oregon, I was washing the dishes. The kids were in bed, and this idea had really been pressing on my mind. So I told Kyle, you know, it's been several years now that we've been living in Oregon, and our dream is still there. So let's make it a reality. I think it's time. We've been saving our pennies, putting any extra cent toward our savings account labeled travel. I think we need to put a date on the map. So we got out one of our kids' laminated world map placemats, and we got out some dry erase markers, and we started sketching out routes. We started just dreaming and scheming. Which direction would we go? Where would we go? What season is best for what place? How would we navigate between countries? Would we fly? I mean, obviously we'd fly across the oceans, but would we fly between countries, or would we, I don't know, take buses, take trains? What would we do? Like, what are the nitty-gritty details? Well, we realized fairly soon that while, we, yeah, we needed to plan, we also needed to keep things fairly wide open. Because if we over-planned, we might accidentally paint ourselves into a corner. So what we did do, though, is we finally circled a square on the calendar. And the date we chose was when our youngest would have been barely four and our oldest was nine. And we picked this particular time because, honestly, I wanted all the kids to be out of diapers. You know, we have friends that travel all over the place and you know, in a similar fashion, out of backpacks, and they have babies, so it can absolutely be done. But me personally, I wanted everyone to be potty trained just for my own sanity. And I also wanted everybody to be able to carry their own backpacks. I wanted them to experience what it would mean to live out of what you had on your back for a year. And yet, I also didn't want our kids to be so old that we would have to uproot them from certain commitments. 
You know, we knew with our oldest being nine that it wouldn't be too long from then that she would start wanting to plant some more roots somewhere, you know, to really solidify some of her relationships that mattered and get involved in some outside activities where she might have a hard time leaving behind. And so for us, this felt like a really good window of time. And honestly, plus, I'm a big believer that the more kids travel, the better travelers they become. Up till then, they had been doing quite a bit of travel, and I saw that they really could do this. And yet they were still young enough to be adaptable and flexible and just go with the flow and learn as we went. I personally also needed to prep my work. By this time, my work as a writer and podcaster was our main source of family income. So we were going to take it with us on the go. This is not going to be a vacation. This is not going to be a sabbatical. We were going to work from the road. And so I started prepping my work about a year in advance, saying no to certain things that before I would normally say yes to, started to automate things as best as possible, you know, work with my team that would be here stateside so that we had all our ducks in a row and made sure that we knew what we were doing because there would be times maybe when I wouldn't be able to connect or communicate or, you know, I would just go dark. I didn't know. As an entrepreneur, I'm very much a fly by the seat of my pants type of person when it comes to my work. But for this, I needed to strategize my work for a long length of time. A year for me was a long length of time. We also needed to prepare for school. By this time, our oldest would be in fourth grade, my middle guy would be in first, and our youngest was still in preschool. But we knew we needed to take some school with us, and we wanted to do it minimally. So this meant that the entire year before in Oregon, we homeschooled. We wanted to prepare them for that mindset and that thought process about what school was so that when we took it on the road with us, that it wouldn't be an added shock to their system to suddenly do something new. And so we prepped by fully homeschooling for a year so that it could become world schooling. We wanted to use the world as our primary textbook. You know, I didn't want us to be so beholden to a curriculum that, you know, we're going to do this today, even though the Great Wall of China is right out there. Yeah, that's great, but we're sticking to this. You know, I wanted to say, no, we're going to learn Chinese history because it's right out there. So we planned the most minimal resources we would need and added as little as possible to our packs. We also, we started practicing living out of a backpack by taking a few road trips for a few weeks at a time. We picked out packs for everybody we thought we could carry. And after a lot of trial and error, we packed what we thought we would need for a whole year with honestly a lot of a, a really big question mark because you really can't plan for this kind of thing perfectly. At some point, you just have to go. And we had to just own up to the fact that, you know what? They have toothpaste all over the world. We'll be okay. We can find whatever we need most likely within the year. You know, people sometimes ask me, how did you know when you were ready to take this trip, when you had everything you would need and when it was time? And I honestly answer by saying, we didn't. You know, it's kind of like getting married or having kids. You're never going to be 100% ready. At some point, it's just a step of faith. You've got to go. And so that's what we did. We just said, we got to get on the plane and see what happens. And so we did. On September 15th, 2014, we boarded a plane westbound for China. We knew we wanted to go in that direction, westbound, largely because of weather. <laughs> In some ways, we had followed the sun because of that particular time of year. We'd spend the fall in the warm parts of Asia, and then we'd dip below the equator during you know, December and January, and then pop back up or above the equator around March or so for spring and on. And this is largely because of packing. We wanted to travel light. We didn't want to have to pack huge parkas that we wouldn't need half the year. And we also knew that we needed to flex. So we only started with concrete plans about three months at a time. And we did this because, on the one hand, we just needed to decide something. You know, we could research day and night, but at some point you just have to make a plan and say, I think we might want to go to these places, we'll have to see. So we decided that we'd play it out for the first three months or so and then revisit and then plan the next three months. Or if we were desperate, we'd hit the escape button and head home. It felt a little reassuring in a way, at least at first, because we weren't completely saddled with a whole year's worth of plans. We knew we could leave if we needed to after a few months. We also knew that we wanted to have this combined fast, slow flow with what we were going to do. 
What I mean by that is we didn't want to travel so fast, so much of the time that we would exhaust ourselves, that we would just you know, go, 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 and forget to enjoy the process, forget to live life, and not make time for things like school and work, which we still had to do. And so we created this rhythm where several weeks at a time, we'd be sightseeing and exploring, going from place to place and trying all the new things. And then following that, we would have several weeks of just chill time. And so we would call it a fast, slow flow. So we would go to a guest house and just be. We would cook dinner, we would catch up on school and work. It kind of looked a little bit like life back home. We'd enjoy each other's company and we'd see where we were, of course, but we wouldn't prioritize seeing all the things and instead sacrifice rest, sacrifice time together, sacrifice catching up on the, you know, just daily liturgy of things we had to be responsible for. So because of that, we weren't going to bucket list this trip. We weren't going to create this checklist of things we absolutely had to do because we knew that that would be a recipe for disappointment because we knew it wouldn't work. From our experience of life cross-culturally and the travel we did before this, we knew it's more enjoyable to just simply be in a place and enjoy the presence of being there than it is to have a list and make sure you saw it all before you left. That just wasn't our style. That still isn't our style. And so we threw out any semblance of a bucket list. And that turned out to be a really good thing because we had a few spur of the moment uh, moments in our trip that we would have missed otherwise. When we were staying put in Thailand for about six weeks at a time, there, we were there for the Loi Kratong Festival, the Lantern Festival, and a few days beforehand, I guess they were practicing, so there was this lantern that just like flittered and landed on the grass in our front yard. And so we had this impromptu science experiment with heat and fire, and you know, we got to play with this lantern. Um, there was a time when we were just driving through Germany, and we saw an exit and it just said like historic marker so we just took an exit and said what's this and so we came to a village and it turned out this is the village where Hitler wrote Mein Kampf and where Johnny Cash was stationed in the army and where Eisenhower first you know released POWs and it's like oh my goodness this is a totally tiny village we would have never known about had we had some kind of plan some kind of agenda of where we needed to be well I'll admit that this whole thing was really hard <laughs> the first few months you know, going to Asia first was like jumping into the deep end of a freezing cold pool. You know, coming from a Western country, you really can't get more opposite when it comes to mindset from the East and the West. And it was really hard the first few months. China was a challenge, and that was our first country. And I remember when we left several weeks after that, I thought, at least I know from now on, everything will probably feel easier. I remember a few months into this, we were in one of our slow periods resting in Chiang Mai, and one evening Kyle and I were going on a neighborhood walk, and we looked at each other and we said, what the heck are we doing? You know, it's been a few months, and it feels like it's been years. This is going to be the longest year of our life, because it already feels like an eternity, and we're still in Asia. <laughs> And we had plans to see the whole world. We were going to go in one direction westbound. We were going to go to Australia, New Zealand, go into Africa, go to several countries there, go up into Europe, go to South America. We had these plans. And at the three-month mark, they felt nearly impossible. Well, we ended up needing to make some adjustments on the road, which is why it turned out to be a good thing that we were just going a few months at a time. About two-thirds of the way, we realized we had to scrap South America. And not because we wanted to. In fact, that was a hard decision because we gave the kids, you know, an option just to tell us if you could see one thing in our year, what would be, what would, you know, what would make you happy? And of course, one of our kids mentioned something in South America. So it was really hard to break the news that we weren't going to be able to go there. The decision had somewhat to do with funding, but it also really had more to do with some scheduling with family back home and health reasons. It wasn't specifically South America that was the problem. It was more the long-term, big-picture idea of this trip. And it ultimately made sense that if we had to scrap an area, it would be there. It would be there. Well, the thing that made this an unexpected challenge, though, is that we ended up in Europe earlier than we had planned, and so therefore we got there when it was still pretty cold. So we arrived in southern France basically wearing what we had been wearing along much of the equator for most of the year. We were freezing. We had to go to the store and stock up on a sweater for everybody and some hats and gloves from the market. This was part of our going with the flow. We made room in our packs then by just leaving some stuff out, you know, some stuff that we no longer needed that we used while we were along the equator. 
And then honestly, ultimately, after the school year had ended, near the end, we really didn't want it to stop. We'd look back at that earlier time back in Asia, and we'd think, wow, at that point, we thought it was going to last forever. But once we hit the halfway mark, the halfway point, it just flew by. The trip started going so fast. And it was near the end, just a few weeks before we were leaving, and Kyle and I were sitting in a bar in Germany in a village in the middle of nowhere. I don't even know where it was. And we were having drinks, and we were toasting our having done this thing. We kept our kids alive while going around the world. <laughs> and we sat there and we thought, okay, what's, what's next for us? Where are we going to live? What are we going to do? What's next for our family? And it was genuinely a little bit sad because we wanted to keep going. We really did. But we honestly needed to stop at some point. And it was mostly because it was time. We also had this inner longing for some rootedness. We were ready to park. We wanted to settle into a place and call it home. We'd actually sold our house before we left, so a lot of this year felt like traveling without any sort of safety net. We kind of felt like we belonged both everywhere and nowhere. Our very few possessions that we didn't take with us that we still kept were in a storage unit in the middle of Oregon. Otherwise, we didn't have any commitment to any place. And it was then that I realized that this trip, this you know, long journey we were taking as a family, it wasn't a vacation, and it wasn't a sabbatical. It was a pilgrimage. And it was a pilgrimage because we didn't go on it to escape life. We went on it to lean into it. We wanted to hear from God, from the act of journeying, and from the being in different places. So here's ultimately what I learned about travel from our year. Travel is good for your soul. Travel can draw you closer to God, and travel makes you a better human if you let it. And the way you let it all has to do with mindset. So I'm going to unpack these a little bit. The first one, that travel is good for your soul, well, here's the thing. Travel forces you to slow down especially for us Americans. That's a big deal. You have to wait. You have to wait in lines. You have to wait for buses. You have to wait for airplanes. You have to wait, and that can be challenging, especially if you don't know what's going on where you are. You have to walk everywhere so much more than what we're used to in our culture where we drive everywhere. You have to be dependent on the culture. A lot of times in ways you don't know how you're being dependent on. A lot of these cultures, many times outside the U.S., they value relationships and people over agendas. And while we might mostly agree with that idea in heart and spirit, it's surprising how hard that is in practice. You know, whenever you want to accomplish something, something is as good or as neutral as, you know, buying groceries or withdrawing money from the ATM, all these things that you need to do, that can be part of your agenda and you don't realize it until you're in the midst of an endeavor like this and everything takes so much longer than you want. Travel is also good for your soul because it forces you to be more present. It's a mindfulness shift. Now, this is not naturally easy for me. I tend to be pretty future-oriented and forward-thinking. So it was in those first few months when we were in Asia that I realized I'm constantly just thinking about what's next. And I'm not enjoying the moment the way I want. You know, like I said, we had plowed through Asia, plowed through China as a way to almost like get through it and say, okay, we did China, we can do the rest of this trip. When we got to Hong Kong, I was overwhelmed with the sights and smells and interest of it all. And then when we finally got to Southeast Asia, I felt like we could breathe a little bit and slow down, and it was genuinely enjoyable. But it wasn't until several months later when we got to Australia and Queensland, the northeastern state there, where everything really does feel a bit slower, where you have these amazing natural wonders like the Daintree Rainforest, the oldest rainforest in the world, sitting side by side up against the Great Barrier Reef. And I realized then, like, okay, I have got to enjoy the moment. I need to make sure on this experience that I'm fully present in every place that we go. And so travel's good for your soul because it asks you to be fully present. It's also good for your soul because it does awaken your senses. Everywhere you go, there are new sights, new smells, new sounds, even new touches. 
You know, Asian and African markets are full of people yelling and talking and smells are going past you that you've never smelled before. You go to the market in France to buy cheese that'll just blow your mind with different tastes you've never tasted before in your life. The calls to prayer in Muslim countries will remind you that you're not at home. And the sound of Victoria Falls pounding a mile away from your guest house will remind you of the awe of creation not too far from you. You know, Australian and Croatian and Thai water, you know, these stunningly gorgeous beaches, each of them looking a little different with a slightly different shade of blue and, and the white sands and then the dirt everywhere. It's surprising how similar the dirt is in different places. You know, the dirt in Italy looks similar to the dirt in Morocco, to the dirt in Sri Lanka, to the dirt in New Zealand, and yet it's also subtly different. You know, when I think of Uganda and our time there, the first thing that comes to mind is still how red the dirt is there, and it's different from any other place I've ever seen in the world. And so with this, travel is also good for your soul because of the natural beauty of creation you get to immerse yourself in. You get to step away from watching these places from around the world through a screen and actually step into them physically with our bodies and be near the Great Barrier Reef, be in the Maasai Mara in Kenya, you know, witness the Alps and go on a hike through them in the springtime to see Heidi's house or drive through the Southern Alps in New Zealand and walk through where they film Lord of the Rings and you know, endless pastures and lakes and beaches. It's like what William Cowper says. He says, nature is, or, nature is another name for an effect whose cause is God. You know, nature is usually where God shows off the best. And so when you get to travel, you get to experience so much of it firsthand. So travel is good for your soul. It's also good for you because it can draw you closer to God if you allow it to. It can deepen your relationship with God. Travel awakens your awareness of God as a creative creator. There's so much various natural beauty in different places, but also in different people. Hearing different languages, seeing different skin colors, seeing different cultural ways of life, of how different people interact as a family, of eating, of dressing, of being. It's like what Philip Yancey says. He says, a God wise enough to create me and the world I live in is wise enough to watch out for me. And so you're aware of how noticed you are by God by laying witness, to, laying witness to so many people around the world you're bumping shoulders with who are walking by you who are also noticed by God. Another reason travel can draw you closer to God is because your assumptions are questioned about your faith. You're asked square in the face to admit what is true Christianity What are your deeply seated beliefs and what's simply Americanism? You know, here we have so many beliefs that we hold on to that largely turn out to be cultural and therefore aren't black and white orthodoxy. And it's amazing how many of those we hold on to that we don't realize until we're in a different culture. And travel can also draw you closer to God because you're reminded of how little you matter in the world in a good way. I say that simply because, you know, in our hyper-connected world through screens, it's so easy for us to instantly talk to hundreds or thousands of people on the other side of the planet like it's no big deal. And it's easy to think that you could, I don't know, be somebody important or that you're well-connected or that you have some kind of influence on the world. And while that might be true in a tiny way, really, whenever you're out there, you know, you're out on an island in the middle of the ocean and you look around and you say, nobody here knows who I am. That is so good for your relationship with God. Because here's the thing, you realize that even if you matter somewhat a little bit in the world, you matter so much to God. And so do all these other people around you. It's like what's said in Psalm 8. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you've set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him? and the son of man that you care for him. You're invited to ask that question when you're face to face with so many people from around the world. And then travel also draws you closer to God because of our call from God to steward the earth. You know, when you're stepping foot in all these villages and cities, when you're face to face with both 
poverty and wealth, and when you see the myriad ways of life, you realize the sacred obligation to tread lightly and yet also be mindfully present. Our actions here in our home in the U.S. have implications around the world. And so it's a sobering reminder in your relationship to God that God wants you to steward the earth where you are, wherever you're planted, at home. And then finally, travel's good for you because it makes you a better human being. You know, a travel cultivates patience. It cultivates patience with your family. You have to be more patient than you ever have in your life when you're traveling with them. When we were doing what we were doing to that magnitude, I'd frequently joke that our constant time together, the five of us, was both the best and the hardest part of our trip. I remember one time sitting in our guest house on the back patio in New Zealand. It had been several months into our trip and the sun was setting and the kids were playing. It was an otherwise beautiful day. And I remember thinking, okay, I'm here with these people again. <laughs> these are the four people I'm traveling with that we've been traveling with for 24 seven the past few months and we're gonna continue doing that for months on end. It really asks you to Strengthen your patience with these people that know you best and the people that you love the most. Travel makes you a better human because you also have to cultivate patience with other cultures. You realize how much you go into these different places with assumptions you don't mean to go in with. You have to admit that your mindset, you know, is, wow, there are some things about these places I don't understand or honestly, I don't really love. And yet, I need to embrace it and admit and realize that this isn't necessarily wrong or bad. It's just different. Hard, for me, does not equal bad or wrong. An example of this is the concept of lines. So many cultures around the world have a more laissez-faire approach to lines than we do in the U.S., so whenever everyone is crowding around in a very, you know, Lord of the Flies, every man for himself, whoever makes it to the front is the winner kind of concept. And you as an American, you have this mindset that, you know, lines work. They're logical. You, you really struggle with this because you have this sense of, okay, this is not fair. You're asked to, cult- to cultivate a deeper sense of patience than you ever thought possible. You also have to cultivate patience with yourself. You know, you can't escape you, (laughs) whether you're here at home or whether you're traveling around the world, and you're slammed in the face with this truth. And whenever you're traveling, you have to give yourself more grace. You know, it's an interesting thing to experience what you end up being like whenever you're dealing with a language you don't truly understand, or you're in a really crowded, sweaty bus, or when an older woman is yelling at you and you don't know what they're saying, but it has something to do with your kids, or... Whenever the Wi-Fi is slow (laughs) or down and you honestly desperately need to work and you cannot find Wi-Fi anywhere, you really learn to give more grace to yourself because in all these things that you do and experience, you're still yourself. And you learn so much about your core you-ness. And if you're willing to listen and if you're willing to ask God to help you, you can actually come out of it on the other side liking yourself more than you ever thought possible because you can you realize that you can do hard things and travel makes you a better human because it's also a bonding time like no other you know when you travel with your family you end up having the shared experience that only you guys have the five of us have this year together that nobody else remembers these experiences we will have together shared for the rest of our lives that can't help but bond us a little closer together. Travel also makes you a better human because of that idea of living more in the present. You start looking people in the eye. You start slowing down and just embracing wherever you are. You know, you look at the barista at the Italian coffee bar and just make small talk. But you're having less screen time because half the time they don't work. One of the things I noticed when we came back from the States was that I saw so many more tops of people's heads than before we left, because suddenly everybody was on their phone all the time. It was an eye-opening reality to my home culture. And then travel makes you a better human because you're living with less. I thought that would be one of the hardest things about our experience, living out of a backpack with only a few things for that entire year, but it turns out that was quite possibly one of my favorite things about the whole experience. 
Turns out I loved only having a few items of clothing to pick from. Who knew? I mean, there were times when it got a little tiring, and, you know, I wish I had more than three shirts to pick from, but on the whole, I actually really loved having less decision fatigue, and I loved realizing I can do this. I can live with just a few things. I can office out of my backpack. The kids can do their school with what's on their backs. You know, I think with today's technology and our ability to get whatever we need from anywhere in the world, pretty much, honest to goodness, it really is possible to travel pretty light. One little thing that I noticed uh, in our few months is that at the end, I still had the same pen that I started with. And that felt like a big deal for me because beforehand, I felt like I was constantly losing pens. It turns out I could keep the same pen for the entire trip. This was a big deal for me. And of course, as soon as we came back, started losing pens again. As soon as we settled into a house and, you know, got back to some sort of normal life. And so with this, traveling around the world without a place to call home and living out of a backpack made us appreciate the idea of home like we never thought possible. We craved and valued a certain rootedness that we were longing for by the time we finished. And so travel makes you a better human by helping you value your home, your place in the world. Home and travel go together. They play in tandem. And because of this, I think it's important to remember that there really is a theology of place that we can embrace and learn from. You know, we live in specific times and places, and this affects who we are and what we do and how we relate to God. There seems to be a picture of God embracing the particularities of the created world in Scripture. We're called to cultivate the earth, and this is important because it's through these particular places that we act within the created world as a whole. We call and we live out our calling to steward the earth in particular places. It's like what's said in Acts 17, and God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place. You know, followers of God have taken pilgrimages to specific places around the world since the beginning of human history. All a pilgrimage really is, is a meaningful journey to a sacred place. And this has been happening since the dawn of human history, pretty much. In fact, Psalms 120 to 134 are actually psalms of ascent sung by the faithful on pilgrimages on their way to Jerusalem. We also see recorded in the New Testament that Jesus went with his family to Jerusalem, And there were all sorts of medieval pilgrimages to Jerusalem. And when that city became too challenging for them to travel to, new pilgrimage routes were created all over the world to different places. In Europe, there were specific sacred spots, spots important in church history. And the faithful would travel to them because place matters. The being somewhere physically matters. And it can cultivate our relationship with God. It can draw us closer to God. And, you know, if pilgrimages are meaningful journeys to sacred places, here's the thing. I mean, yes, there are places that are meaningful to church history that are important because so-and-so was born there or this thing happened there. But here's the thing. If God created the world, if God's fingerprints are all over it, then that pretty much means every place is sacred because of God's having created it. It's like what the poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning says. She says, Earth is crammed with heaven, and every common bush a fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit around and pluck blackberries. We can take pilgrimages anywhere and everywhere. It all has to do with mindset. With the sort of travel, we can posture ourselves with an expectant hope of meeting God on the road as we walk, as we stand on a place of significance. This can happen anywhere, from a monumental spot, from a time of history that matters to you, to your grandmother's childhood home. It all has to do with the questions you ask yourself when you're there. Asking yourself questions like, why am I here? What can this place teach me about myself, about God? Why do I live where I live now? And what is God asking me Oh, asking of me in that particular place. Should I stay there? Should it stay my home? Why should I go elsewhere? These are all good questions to ask to make travel more of an act of pilgrimage, a more meaningful experience. Now, places matter, and it's good to go to them so that we better recognize our place in the world. 
But here's the thing. It's also good to go home and be all there and to firmly plant ourselves in our God-given communities. Benedictine monks are a particular order that are a little different than other sort of monastic traditions in one way. They take four vows instead of the usual traditional three vows. And the fourth vow that makes them different is called the vow of stability. And what that means is they vow to stay put whenever things are challenging and hard. Unless God gives them a clear reason and makes it you know, blatantly obvious that they need to be elsewhere, they're going to stay. So what makes travel special is the contrast of home. In this day and age, it's easier than ever to just get up and move to a new place. But it's actually healthy and good to stay put and dig roots, even when it gets hard, or honestly, even worse, when it gets boring. There are a lot of reasons to be in a particular place. Right now, we live in Texas because of what we originally said, people over trees. <laughs> we said this because we moved from Oregon, which is stunningly beautiful in the natural world, to Texas, which is lovely. <laughs> And so we had to remind ourselves, we are moving to Texas because we value people over trees. And there's lots of reasons to live in a particular spot on the earth. It might be a job, it might be family obligations, it might be a personal preference. When you travel, you're aware of this thing called placemaking, which involves letting God take care of you through a place. There's a lot of great reasons to travel, and we should embrace them. But travel is great because of its contrast to home. We can let God use both places worldwide and our own homes to take care of us. When we were traveling, we used to say, we noticed after a while, when, the kid, when we kept doing like, just really amazing thing after amazing thing, and the kids were increasingly less, less impressed with each event that we experienced, Kyle and I would say to each other, we've got to remember, when everything is awesome, nothing is awesome. And that's because we need those mundane, everyday moments of stirring soup and running errands to keep getting out on the road and going on the pilgrimage as a special occasion. So what are the practical applications of something like this? You know, am I here to convince you you've got to get on the road and travel around the world with your family? Well, here's the thing. I think you should go ahead and dream. I think sometimes we're afraid of our dreams being too big, but they're not too big to God. I think it's okay. <laughs> I think if you listen to your soul, if you spend some time in prayer, and you sense that God is whispering something to you, whether it's traveling around the world like this, or perhaps traveling more locally where you guys live, or perhaps you know, taking that road trip you've always wanted to take, or visiting that one family member that's been on your mind for a long time, or going to that one place that's special to your family history. Listen to that whisper and don't brush it off as too big of an idea. So dream big, but also start small. Enjoy your local area and appreciate the place that it is. I hear you guys live in a pretty beautiful part of the country. <laughs> so embrace that. You know, be a homegrown tourist. Even if you've lived here your whole life, I'm sure there are places you have not been to yet. You haven't seen it all. So enjoy where God's planted you here. I mean, practically speaking, go ahead and start saving now. You know, big long-term travel is actually not as expensive as you might think it is. And, you know, I'm happy to answer any practical questions you might have in that department. But at least start saving because you might be surprised one day when you're ready for your pilgrimage. It's time. And you'll be glad you did. And then another thing. Work through some relational and personal issues now, and don't save those for a trip, as though out there is where you'll find yourself, <laughs> because here is where you can find yourself just as well out on the road. Of course, pilgrimages are important because they help us see a part of ourselves in God's eyes we wouldn't otherwise see. And yes, travel does help you walk through those issues deeper. And yet, at the same time, travel is like a cup of water that if you put it down on the car and then go over a speed bump, the water's going to splash out. So travel is like that speed bump. Whatever is in you now will splash out when the bumps come. So don't wait for some big epic experience to start working through those relational issues or personal issues. Also, just notice the things in your daily life. 
Be a noticer. Look for those things now where you live. Exotic bird sounds are only exotic because they're new to you. The birds in your front yard are worth noticing, and they're good to appreciate. Our safari guide in Kenya, who takes countless people into the Maasai Mara to witness elephants and lions and giraffes and zebras out in the wild, he told us that he likes to watch National Geographic documentaries about North America because he is fascinated by deer and the bears. <laughs> to him, those are exotic. So this year of ours ended up being a pilgrimage and not a vacation and not a sabbatical. But here's the other thing. It's also okay to take vacations. <laughs> Not every act of travel has to be a pilgrimage. We can learn to rest, to embrace the enjoyment of travel. There's no need to over-spiritualize a thing that I think God just wants us to enjoy at face value. I think God has partly given us this great big world to enjoy, you know, to see the value of physically walking and being somewhere in a different place. And then also, don't write off travel as not for you. If this idea feels daunting, remember, hard doesn't equal bad or wrong. I really do believe God has made us to do hard things. So to wrap up, I really do think travel is good for us because it's good for our souls. And it draws us closer to God, and it can make us better humans because it connects our physical selves, our very bodies, with our spiritual, mental, and emo emotional selves through the gift of place, through the sacredness in every corner of the world. I like what Wendell Berry says in A Place on Earth. He says, nobody can discover the world for somebody else. Only when we discover it for ourselves does it become common ground and a common bond and we cease to be alone. Thank you guys. Thank you, Tish. Um, I'm going to let her rest her voice. We're going to open this up to a period of questions and answers. So if you do have a, a question you would like to ask, I would invite you to come forward to the mic uh, to my right uh, or my left, your left, your right. Um, in a moment, I'm going to make a couple of announcements and thank, thank yous. Uh, in the meantime, um, first one is uh, we, we always have five events. Uh, for these Faith and Life seasons. Uh, we booked our fifth and final speaker a long time ago uh, for this season, but we did not book the date. And um, if you have followed the series uh, and, and get our emails and so forth, you will know that we finally did nail down a date for our last event of the year. It features a uh, professional golfer and Minnesota native, Tom Lehman. Uh, that date is in your program tonight. It's a, it's a Wednesday, which is atypical. Typically we meet on Thursdays, but it's Wednesday, April 17th at 7 o'clock here uh, in this sanctuary again. So if you're a fan of golf, or frankly, even if you're not, Tom is a really wonderful, uh, thoughtful person, and I hope you can uh, join us for that final um, season-ending event for this year's season. Um, if you would like us to remind you of those kind of things, uh, please subscribe to our email list. You can do that at faithandlife.org. Uh, you can also like our Facebook page um, and uh, hear about events that way. While we're talking about media as well, um, I will point out Tish was gracious enough um, to do a little Q&A interview for a magazine that we have started doing quarterly here at St. Philip Deacon. If you'd like to read that interview um, and her very thoughtful questions, uh, you can find that at spdlc.org slash inspire um, and we actually do have some hard copies of it I believe at the welcome counter so if you're interested in going old school and reading a magazine with a cup of tea uh, see the welcome counter before you leave um, I do want to say a few thank yous uh, as well um, as I say I've, I've said this now again for 16 years uh, this series is not a budget item of this congregation this congregation uh, sort of convenes these events as a gift to the community, um, but the costs of, of a series like this, which are many, are borne by amazing, incredible, generous individuals and uh, local organizations who have uh, been incredibly supportive uh, over these many, many years. Uh, they are all listed 
uh, I hope, this is one of the, I, I wake up in the middle of the night worrying, oh gosh, did we forget someone? I hope everyone is listed. If you are, if you are a supporter and you're not listed, please tell me and we will rectify that. Um, I, I'll mention just a few of the major donors. The Thrivent Financial has been with us for a, a very long time from the very beginning. Uh, Ulrich Real Estate um, Group, thank you to Beth and Eddie there. Rapid Packaging, uh, Phil and Mona and Mike. I didn't, I didn't see everyone before we started, but I don't know if you're here, but thank you. Uh, Productivity Inc., Greg and Lisa Buck, thank you very much. Um, Mastercraft Labels, Jeff and Patrice, thank you. Uh, Cressa, Jim and Ruthann, I know you are here over there. Thank you both very, very much for your generosity. Um, Mally Design uh, works with us both to develop our materials and also actually has become a financial supporter, so Mally, thank you. Honeybee Capital is uh, run by Catherine Collins who's a former speaker, actually, and was so taken by what we're doing here that she has become a corporate sponsor, which is something you could always consider, <laughs> Tish. Um, <laughs> is she subtle. <laughs> subtle? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Anselm House uh, has been a partner for the last few uh, years. Rachel is on the staff of Anselm and is here tonight. Rachel, I don't know where you are. Uh, right here. She's heading to London in a few weeks for a trip. I don't know if it's a pilgrimage or a retreat or <laughs> whatever. You can, all of those things. Anyway, um, so we're able to come tonight because of the wonderful generosity of, of these individuals, these organizations. Many of them are here tonight. Will you join me in saying thank you? Um, and then a couple of other quick thank yous. Uh, Sarah with Subtext Books is out at in the Narthex. Um, Subtext Books is uh, a big independent uh, bookseller in St. Paul. They've been very generous with their time. Um, we don't make any money from the sales, and uh, they're very gracious to come and, and, and offer books for sale. So you can get Tish's book following this event, and she will be happy to inscribe it. And Sarah, thank you for making the trek all the way over from St. Paul. Uh, to be in Plymouth with us. Um, one of the questions I get again and again is where do you get the ideas for our, our, your speakers, and they come from a variety of places. Uh, we are planning next year's series, I will tell you, if you have ideas. Uh, we haven't fully booked the series yet. We have most of it booked, but feel free to fill out this form and make suggestions. And to be honest with you, I've had so many good suggestions over the year. I'm not really sure who suggested Tish, but it, was it Amanda? Was it you? It was. Okay, so Amanda Berger on our staff, um, who's also the managing editor of this magazine I mentioned, uh, gave me the idea. So to the degree you like Tish, will you thank Amanda for inviting her through me? So thank you, Amanda. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> And then finally, a word of thanks as always to our, our dear friend of the series, Jeff Elstad. Jeff has been, he was sort of in conversation with me before the series even started. I think he's missed two of the events and he's generous to share his beautiful music with us before and after. So Jeff, thank you as always. Okay, now we're gonna have a chance to ask some questions and get some answers, uh, assuming there are some. So don't be shy. Again, the mics are up front here. Anyone? All right. <laughs> Hello, and thank you for being here. It was interesting. And you touched a little bit on uh, how some of our beliefs and our things we um, probably believe as truth maybe are changed through travel. And I'm wondering if you and your family went to the Middle East, and if so, were you enlightened, or what did you learn, or mm -hmm. how did it change you? Yeah. Well, um, you know, it's a little tricky because we uh, lived in Turkey for three years, and that's largely the Middle East. Um, you know, Turkey is kind of this crossroads between the East and West in a lot of ways, but it is very Middle Eastern in a lot of ways. Um, we were planning on going. We have some friends in Lebanon, and we actually have some friends in Iraq, and we were going to go visit them. But then a lot of stuff started happening right as we were going to go. And we looked at our kids and we're like, I'm not sure that's the best idea. So we ended up not going there. I did go on a side trip to Israel with some friends and uh, for a work thing. 
And so I was there. And so in some ways, yes. I mean, the thing that's also interesting is that a lot of cultural or political boundaries are still there, but the cultural landscape kind of shifts and evolves and the boundaries aren't as tight. So there's a large Middle Eastern population, for example, in Italy, a huge one in Germany, that kind of thing. And so we were definitely rubbing shoulders with a lot of people that, people that come from those lands. And I think in general, you know, there might not have been a very specific, deeply held belief that we personally had that was shifted probably because of our time having first lived in Turkey and before that Kosovo. You know, Kosovo is a Muslim majority country as well. And so we were already, we felt a little bit different than a lot of our American counterparts who hadn't traveled much. But we were reminded a lot of um, a lot of the, you know, differences. You know, when I was in Israel, I met quite a few Palestinian Christians, and that was really, really great to meet with them, you know, in Bethlehem and these different places and talk face to face and see how some of our maybe, you know, American policies affect them, not for the better. And, um, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with um, what we can learn from, I would say, Muslim majority countries about, or cultures about hospitality. You know, um, I would argue that they're about the most hospitable people on earth. That I've ever met in terms of welcoming you into their home and you know putting out all the stops in terms of food and and celebrating you as a guest and honoring you and giving you the coat off their back and all the food you could possibly stand and just the most amazing welcoming people and I would think that maybe I know of some people who might be surprised by that <laughs> perhaps um, but you know in general I think you know, it's funny, you in some ways leave an experience like this with more questions than like for sure answers about this is what this means. And I think that's healthy for us no matter how often we travel, it's good to remember and, and see firsthand, you know, that a lot of our assumptions about the way certain people are, or maybe what it means to believe certain things might not be as true as I think they are. So, yeah, it's a good question. Anything else? <laughs> have to wait until she's done with her question True. and get up to the mic, <laughs> by, the, by the way. Thanks for your thoughts. I'm, I'm aware that your family went on this pilgrimage very much as students to learn and observe and absorb. I'm curious, in those places, you must also have been teachers, sort of ambassadors for the U.S. I wonder what that experience was like. Were you conscious of setting example or, or embarrassed that you're American? I just wonder about sure. the, the teacher side of that experience. That's a fun question, yeah. You know, um, like I mentioned, we were in Kosovo in the year 2000, and we were there with an NGO, with two different NGOs, and so Americans were seen at that time as, in some ways, the literal saviors of their situation because the U.S. led the, the convoy of the military to, um, you know, stop Milosevic from all the stuff. And so we were used to, not used to, but we had experienced what it was like to come into town and be thanked profusely as though we did something, you know? And so that was one experience. And then Kyle and I were actually like on 9-11, we were in Turkey, like we landed in Turkey and came there for the first time. And it was interesting how many people, like waiters, people we never, you know, know otherwise, apologized to us. And that was really fascinating to us that these people that had nothing to do with 9-11 would apologize to us. And so we already had this idea of, um, gosh, not everybody thinks the same thing about Americans. Um, and so we would go to different countries that had different opinions, largely. You know, of course, there's nuances within each place. Um, and so we, we came into it, honestly, with more of a learner's posture than a teacher's, no matter what. And we were willing to sort of step up and teach more through relationships and experience in interacting with us than a literal, you know, we're here to teach. And so a lot of it had to do with how we chose to posture ourselves. You know, when we were in Ethiopia and we would go into a family's home to go into it 
humbly and learning and, and being willing to learn, being willing to learn different, you know, phrases and how do you wash your hands, you eat the popcorn and then you eat the coffee. They have a very, you know, there's a whole coffee ritual that involves popcorn in Ethiopia. And I think going in as a posture of learners just inevitably teaches, I probably, I'm hoping anyway, other cultures what it means to be American, that perhaps it doesn't always mean maybe what they think. Because I think as our world is getting more connected, there are more ideas of what it means to be American than maybe there used to be in terms of certain ideolo ideologies, certain political beliefs, um, beliefs about the rest of the world. Um, you know, I think a lot of places, more and more, you know, because we've seen the landscape change from, I started traveling my, uh, internationally in 1993 and on, so I've seen the landscape change quite a bit from um, Americans being the sort of like mecca of where of course everyone wants to be to not so much anymore. And so it's interesting. So I think it's really good as Americans for us to come in as a posture of learning. And in fact, it's among a lot of traveling types, uh, there's a sort of I guess you wouldn't call it a joke, but it's sort of this practice that we laugh at about like telling people you're Canadian, not American, like just to be safe because everybody loves Canadians, which I have Canadian friends that do not like <laughs> that Americans do that. Um, so it's just interesting. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, but I think on the whole, a learner's posture is the way to go pretty much everywhere. And so, um, yeah, that's what we did. Good question. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Now that you've been in Austin for a while, yeah. I would be curious to know if you have any itches that need scratching in future travels in how you would involve your kids in this as they are maturing in their lives. Yeah, we talk about this quite a lot because my oldest is now 14 and my youngest is nine, and, or not nine, he's eight, he's almost nine. Um, and so travel looks a little different now, you know, for those very reasons why I said when we decided to go. She's going to, my oldest is going to be in ninth grade, and taking a high schooler for a school year looks a little bit different than taking a fourth grader. Um, but we talk about it all the time as a family, and they miss traveling if we go pretty far without going traveling. And so we, we talk about it a lot as part of our family DNA and culture and that we still plan on doing it. We spend a lot of our summers traveling. You know, one of the conditions we made when we moved back to Texas is, okay, we're going to do this so long as we get the heck out of Dodge as best we can in the summers. Because the summers there are insanely hot, you know, 90 days in a row, 100 degrees plus. So we're just like, we got to get out of there. Um, so we like to go up to Oregon a lot. We like to go up into Canada and explore. So we still make it part of our DNA, even if we're not maybe going on one long road trip. We also do a lot of day and weekend trips. You know, like right now is actually a great time in uh, central Texas, it's wildflower season. And so, you know, right now our temps are 75, 80 degrees and that's the best time to get out. And so we will go on overnight weekend trips a lot this time of year, or even day trips, and we'll go with our sketchbooks and pull off on the side of the road and draw the cows and the longhorns and the, and the blue bonnets and then go eat barbecue and, you know, kind of be homegrown tourists where we can. But we are also still talking about what does it look like to maybe take one more big international trip before our oldest leaves the nest. And so we're most likely going to do that, not this summer, but next summer. Um, that's roughly the plan. One of the reasons we bought the house where we live in is because it's in a neighborhood that is um, frequently visited by tourists, so we plan to Airbnb it while we go for practical reasons. Um, we have a lot of friends that do that, and it makes travel very affordable in that way. And so um, that's the plan, roughly, maybe next summer to do another trip. And I mean, heck, on the way to the airport, Kyle and I were talking about, okay, what would it look like to go on another year-long trip? Where would we go? And, you know, already dreaming. So I don't think it'll ever stop. Um, it just has to look different, you know, as the kids get older. So. My question is also in regards to your upcoming travels. Uh -huh. um, do you, will your international trip be to South America finally? Is that something <laughs> yes. you all have in mind? Um, and then, as, how do you as a family prioritize where you will travel to? Um, if, when you're doing short-term trips or just even vacations, I mean, you've covered a lot of ground already, and now as you make plans for future trips, mm -hmm. how do you, yeah, how do you make that choice? How do you prioritize where to go? Yeah, 
Well, to answer the first part, yes. Our next hopeful international trip is Central and South America. That, that was our condition whenever we told the kids we had to skip that part. It's okay, next time we're gonna go there. Um, but in terms of how we decide, maybe on smaller trips like a month or shorter, I would say, um, a lot of it you know, has to do with budget and time as well, but um, we still like to have that low and slow, that fast and slow kind of rhythm. And it makes practical sense to go faster whenever there are places that are more expensive and there's more to do. And so we like, if we can help it, to find places that have both of those things close by. So if we're going to go to, say, New York City as a family, we're also going to combine it with some time in a lake house nearby and just be, you know. And so we'll, we'll pair those two ideas together because I, nor Kyle, neither Kyle nor I are people that love to just go, go, go. We don't find that enjoyable. You know, part of our reason to travel is just honestly to rest. Um, and then we also get the kids involved. You know, we, we teach, not we teach, well, we do, but we talk about the world a lot with the kids. We talk about current events, we talk about what's going on, we talk about just different places and what they're like. You know, we have lots of different types of international foods in the home. We just make that part of our more family culture. And so we bring it up a bit and they'll say something about like, I would like to visit fill in the blank. And we'll keep that in mind, you know? And I don't mean just like globally, I also mean in the States, you know, different, different states, different cities. And so we ask the kids a lot of what, what they would like to do. Um, and then, yeah, a lot of it just comes to where do we want to go? I mean, I know that sounds really vanilla, kind of a boring, obvious answer, but that, you know, like this summer we're planning on a Pacific Northwest road trip. We're going to go in a circle. And so we're going to start in Bend to revisit our old family and friends and then go in a big loop and end over by Glacier which is where Kyle's sister lives, and go in a circle. And so we're planning little stops along the way, and a lot of it has to do with, like, what's interesting along the way, with a lot of just open-endedness, so we can do those, you know, random pullovers and scenic views, that kind of stuff. So. I think this will be our last one. No, you, you can, yeah, please, yeah. Uh, thanks so much for all your sharing. Um, I've, I follow your podcast and your blog, and so I've heard a little bit about the Literary London trip. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, is that something that you have also on the horizon? And are there other similar hopes and dreams for that kind of thing? Yeah, that's a great final question, actually. Yeah, so last year, a friend of mine and I beta tested this idea called Literary London, where we led a group of six women to London to, um, and we used a literary route as our sort of framework for going, and we absolutely loved it. And uh, I mean, to me, it was one of the best experiences of my life, definitely in my career. I've always wanted to incorporate meaningful travel in a way, like taking people with me, not just telling them this would be a great idea, but actually like travel the way I do. This would be fun to do together. And so we're going to do it again this summer. We have another literary London trip that's in the works. Six women are joining us actually seven, and we're staying in a house outside of London, and we're going to do the same. You know, we're doing C.S. Lewis, Jane Austen, Tolkien, um, all these. I mean, I've been to London many times, and it's one of my favorite places on earth, and so it's a great intro to this idea, but I really would like to do more. So right now, I'm actually being trained um, to get my professional life coach certification because I want to start incorporating that idea um, with people and travel. So I'm hoping to start leading Trips as kind of my next thing, along with writing still. I will always write books, but trip leading and book writing, those would be my two favorite things. If I could just do those, I'd be happy. So, yep. Don't start applauding yet, <clears throat> just because I want to say one final thing, which is thank you. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming out on a beautiful uh, night. If you know what happened to Gonzaga, I do not want to hear about it. Um, <laughs> Mostly, though, I want to say thank you to Tish. We've been really looking forward to your time with us. I'm delighted you accepted the invitation. And uh, on behalf of everyone who's here, we have a small gift for you, which uh, is a plaque that says, with thanks to Tish Oxenreiter for bringing faith to life. And thank we thank you, you so thank very you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.